Hello, and welcome to our Thursday studies in the book of the Revelation. Today we're studying the second of the seven churches that the Lord Jesus spoke to, the letter to the church at Smyrna in Revelation chapter 2, verses 8 through 11. I've entitled this, The Persecuted Church. So if you would join me today, uh, we will pray and then uh, study God's word. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today and Father, we thank you for what you teach us from your word. We ask, Heavenly Father, that you would teach us today what it means to stand for you. And Lord, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, today we examine a church that stood for, for Christ in spite of great persecution. Now, Revelation chapter 2, verse 8. To the angel of the church in Smyrna write, the first and the last, the one who is dead and has come to life, says, I know your tribulation and poverty, yet you are rich. Uh, I know the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Don't be afraid of what you're about to suffer. Look, be a, look the devil is about to throw some of you into prison to test you, and you will have tribulation for ten days. Be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. Anyone who has an ear should listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. The victor will never be harmed by the second death. Um, today, as we study this passage of Scripture, I would remind you that Revelation was written by the aged Apostle John, who was exiled on the island of Patmos. If you remember John and his brother James, they were called the Sons of Thunder, at one point, you remember they were called the sons of thunder because they wanted the Lord Jesus to call fire down from heaven on a city in Samaria uh, because, um, because that city refused to accept them. In Luke chapter 9, verses 52 to 54, and he sent messengers ahead of him, and they went and entered a village of the Samaritans to make arrangements for him. But they did not receive him because he was traveling toward Jerusalem, the the Samaritans were prejudiced against the Jews and uh, against full-blooded Jews. And so when they heard the Lord Jesus was coming their way, they said, thanks but no thanks. You can't come into our city. And God's word says when, when James and John heard about that, they were sort of hotheads evidently. Uh, verse 53, but when they did not receive him because he was traveling toward Jerusalem. When his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? And the Lord Jesus said, you don't know what kind of ministry I've got. My mini Basically, he was saying, I don't have a ministry of calling fire down from heaven on people uh, just because they are prejudiced against me. You see, the apostle John, that was his background. And he was a trusted apostle and he was actually probably the best friend of the Lord Jesus on earth. Repeatedly in the Gospel of John, the Apostle John referred to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. And the, the Apostle John also understood and knew what it meant to suffer great loss. Do you remember in Acts chapter 12, God's word says, now at that, about that time, Herod, the king, laid hands on some of them who belonged to the church in order to mistreat them. And he had James, the brother of John, put to death with a sword. The apostle John had his own brother martyred at the hands of King Herod. And now the apostle John is exiled, separated from, from Roman society on the island of Patmos because of his faithfulness to Jesus Christ. And, and so he's the writer, uh, the, the, the recipients of, of these messages are persecuted churches uh, in the book of the Revelation. If you miss the fact that Revelation was written to seven churches who were persecuted, you pretty much miss the entire message of the book. Persecution was extremely common in that day. In fact, the book of the Revelation was written during the, the Emperor Domitian's reign, and he, Domitian, frequent, frequently uh, referred to himself 
and, and made people call him our Lord and God to describe himself. In fact, we, we read about some of the persecution that these Christians experienced in Hebrews chapter 11, verses 35 through 38 where the Apostle John, well, not the Apostle John, the writer of Hebrews said, and others were tortured, not accepting their release, so that they might obtain a better, better resurrection. And others experienced mockings and scourgings, yes, also chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were tempted, they were put to death with a sword. We even see literature, we even see persecution mentioned in the secular literature of that day. From 64 AD, about the time the Apostle Paul died as a martyr, to 313 AD, there were 10 major persecutions of the church. Historians tell us of those 249 years, from 64 AD to 313 AD, uh, only 120 of those years were spent with relative toleration. The other 129 were spent under severe persecution of the church. And indeed, in 64 AD, you remember that um, a fire ravaged Rome. And most, but most scholars believe that the emperor Nero set the fire. And you've heard that Nero fiddled while, while Rome burned. Uh, most people believe that he set Rome ablaze so that he could rebuild it to his own taste. But he had to have somebody to blame it on. Guess who he blamed it on? Nero blamed um, the burning of Rome on Christians of that day. According to the Roman historian Tacitus, uh, he wrote this about Emperor Nero and how he treated Christians. Besides being put to death, the Christians were made to serve as objects of amusement. They were clad in hides of beasts and torn to death by dogs. Others were crucified. Others were set on fire to serve to illuminate the night when daylight failed. Others ended up, what Tacitus is saying, is Christians in that day, some of them were literally human torches just for the pleasure of the Emperor Nero. And so the entire book of the Revelation was written to churches who were being persecuted. And if the date of Revelation is 90 AD, which is pretty, uh, most scholars believe that's when it was, then Christians had already endured two major persecutions. There were eight more to go. And and so the third note that we have to be aware of is Revelation was written to both comfort and challenge Christians. One of the primary messages of the book of the Revelation is we win. Even if we get persecuted, even if we get killed, we win in the end. The Lord Jesus is the King of all kings and Lord of all lords. He's going to have the final say. Um, one of my friends uh, when I give him books, he tends to read the last chapter first. Sort of drives me crazy. He'll read the last chapter and then go back to the start. He wants to know what the end of the book says. Well, the fact of the matter is, we know what the end of the book says. We know what the end of, the, of God's Word says. God's Word says that in the end, Christians win. Jesus is going to return. He's going to wrap rapture and take his church home and he's going to bring judgment upon this old filthy nasty world that is so anti-god and so as we uh look at as we look at uh this um these seven churches five of the seven churches five of these seven churches hear the lord jesus challenge them and call them to repentance. Five of the seven say, uh, hear a message that you've got some good qualities, but you got to change your ways. And five of the seven hear a strong prophetic message. You've got to repent. And even during times of persecution, we learn there were Christians and churches who were not faithful to God. And so the Lord Jesus does not hold anything back. 
The Lord Jesus does not coddle uh, disobedient Christians. The Lord Jesus does not wink at their sinful lifestyles. The Lord Jesus does not water down what he expects. The Lord Jesus does not apologize for his expectations of godly behavior. And, and so the, the fourth note we have is the church at Smyrna was persecuted, but they were one of the churches that remained faithful. Smyrna is actually modern day Izmir, which is in the, the, in the, the country of Turkey. It's actually Turkey's largest seaport after Istanbul. And in John's day, it had a, a large Jewish community. It also had, it was also dominated by people who were fiercely loyal to the emperor of Rome. They were called uh, an imperial cult. In other words, they worshiped the Roman emperor. And they basically said, if you don't, if you don't worship the Roman emperor, then you can't be a part of our work unions and you can't work to provide for your family and you would be excluded from being able to support yourself. And, and so in Revelation 2, 8, and to the church, uh, and to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, the first and last who is dead and has come to life says this, um, verse 9, I know your tribulation and your poverty. The Lord Jesus said, I understand that you're placed under great financial pressure. I understand that your willingness to, to say that the emperor Domitian is both Lord and God. If, if you don't say that, it means you can't feed your families. And the Lord Jesus says, I'm completely aware of your faithfulness to me. And the Lord Jesus says that those Jews who are in Smyrna, who oppose the Christians, um, he says, they are not God's people. He says uh, in verse 9, I know your tribulation and poverty, yet you are rich. Uh, I know the slander of those who say they are Jews but are not. The Lord Jesus says, I know, I know that there, there are literally Jews in Smyrna who say they are God's people, but they're really not God's people. Do you remember in Romans chapter 2, verses 28 and 29, the Apostle Paul said, basically, just because somebody descended from Abraham does not make them a child of God. A child of God is someone who has trusted Jesus as their Savior. The Lord Jesus literally says of these Jews who deny Jesus in Smyrna that they are a synagogue of Satan. That is, they are enemies of the cross. And, and so, the Lord Jesus gives these persecuted Christians in Smyrna a word of encouragement. First, he says, don't be afraid. Um, the Lord Jesus says, be courageous. Don't be fearful. Um, that's in verse 10. Don't be afraid of what you're about to suffer. Secondly, the Lord Jesus says, I know what Satan's plans are. I know what Satan is going to try to do. Uh, what he is about to do is not a surprise to me. I know all about it. When you are tried as traitors to the Roman government, the Lord Jesus says, don't be afraid. Don't back down. The Lord Jesus says it won't be long. In other words, he, he says you're going to be basically tested for 10 days. And that signifies a very brief time. And the Lord Jesus goes on to say, don't allow the persecutions to so uh, discourage you that you deny me. He says, your faithfulness will be rewarded with a winner's crown. And he also says, your faithfulness means that you won't be hurt by the second death that is the lake of fire. And so the book of the Re Re Revelation is written to these seven churches. And as we look at what, what this means, the first principle is simply this. Faithfulness to God. As you look at the, 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 how faithful the church at Smyrna was, Faithfulness to God means you stand with Jesus regardless of the cost. Faithfulness to God means you stand with Jesus regardless of the cost. We all like Billy Graham, bless his soul. He's with the Lord now. And we're thankful for his ministry. But did, did you know that, that Billy Graham stood and said that segregation is wrong? And he didn't say that in the 1990s. He didn't say that in the 1980s. 
He didn't say that in the 1970s. He didn't even say that in the 1960s. Billy Graham said segregation is wrong in 1952 um, when he was preaching through the South. In other words, Billy Graham was faithful to Jesus regardless of what it cost him personally. I uh, think of one of our third graders who prayed at lunch at her school and all the kids made fun of her as she would bow her head to pray over her lunch. Kids would plink her on the head. And she told me, Brother Tommy, I'm not going to stop praying because I'm committed to Jesus. Um, faithfulness to Jesus means that you stand regardless of the cost. But faithfulness to Jesus also means that you're committed to Jesus at the highest level. There was a man named Polycarp that was known as the Bishop of Smyrna. In other words, he was one of the spiritual leaders of this area. And uh, the, um, the Roman emperor came and said, if you don't worship me, if you don't swear by the genius of Caesar, I'm going to, to, to burn you at the stake. And you remember Polycarp said, uh, you, can, you can threaten me with a fire that is temporary, but... While you threaten me with a fire that's temporary, you're going to face a fire that's eternal. And so um, they said, "Well, you, we're, we're about to we're about to light the fire, and so you need to you're going to have to deny Jesus." And Polycarp said, "Eighty and six years I have served him, and he has done me no wrong. Uh, therefore, I cannot deny my Lord." Um, all the martyr. No, and, and so Polycarp ended up dying. He ended up being burned at the stake. Um, all, of the, all of the disciples, with the exception of Judas, obviously, but all of the disciples, except for John, died martyrs' deaths as well. They all died for their faith. They were all committed at the highest level. You say, well, Brother Tommy, how do we express our commitment to Christ? Well, today, obviously, we are not threatened with death, thank the Lord. So what does our commitment to Christ look at? Well, it's in our, a lot of, in a lot of ways, it's in our service to his church. Uh, we have a Christian heritage of people who have literally died for the faith. And, and so, um, very often, uh, our commitment to the Lord uh, doesn't stack up against that, obviously. Sometimes we leave the church of Jesus Christ uh, hanging out to dry because, you know what? It's just inconvenient. It's inconvenient for us to keep the nursery. It's inconvenient for us to teach a Sunday school class. It's inconvenient for us to, 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 to follow through on a commitment we made. You see, faithfulness means, in, in, in our modern world, faithfulness means you show up and if you can't, you may you make sure that your spot is covered. Faithfulness means faithfulness means if you lead a committee, you lead. Faithfulness means that if you're a deacon here, um, you are here when the doors are open and when they end up being closed. Faithfulness means that if you're a member of the choir, that you show up to practice. Faithfulness means if you're a Sunday school teacher, that you are here 15 minutes early for your students. Far too often, far too often. Christians view their commitment to God's church as the least important commitment in their lives, uh, the, as the easiest one to break. And when we do that, we do a disservice not only to Jesus, but also to all those who have died for their faith. Uh, but then thirdly, faithfulness means that as you face an uncertain future, that you don't have to fear. Uh, that's what the apostle, what the Lord Jesus is saying. Um, he says in verse nine, I know your tribulation and poverty, yet you are rich. I know the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Do not be afraid of what you're about to suffer. Um, why don't we have to be afraid? Because we know, number one, that we, that we are standing with Jesus Christ. We know that in eternity that, uh, that we are going to be rewarded for our faithfulness to him. Um, you remember the story from World War II, the children, there were children who were being evacuated from London, uh, 
during the worst of the bombing by Germany. Germany was being bombed nightly by, uh, I mean, London was being bombed nightly by the Germans. And so they put children onto trains to take them out into the countryside to spare them from the bombing. And so they had these trains filled with children. And many of the kids were crying, as you would understand, and many of them were terribly afraid. And as one of the adults who was um, in charge of making sure the kids were okay on the train, as he was walking through the train, he came, came upon a little boy who was not crying at all. He didn't, didn't seem to be anxious at all. And the person sat down next to the little boy and said, well, are you afraid? He said, no, I can't say that I'm afraid. And uh, the person said, well, why aren't you afraid? All these other children are afraid. The little boy said, well, I've just never thought to be afraid. And the person said, well, well, isn't there a reason that you're not afraid? You don't know where this train is taking you. And the little boy said, well, no, I don't know where this train is taking me, but my daddy, my, my pop is the, the, is the engineer on the train. And, and so I know he's, he's taking me to somewhere that's going to be okay. In other words, I can trust my father. Well, with all the upheaval in our world these days and all the ways that the coronavirus has affected us, uh, and perhaps in ways that you have felt like you've been persecuted. And, and things have not gone your way. I think you and I need to take comfort in the fact that, that our God is in ultimate control. I talked to a church member just the other day. And as we talked, he talked about how when he was having heart surgery and he was terribly frightened. He was, he said, brother Tommy, I was so afraid. He said, but God woke me up right before I went into surgery. He said, they'd already given me some medicine to make me sleepy. He said, but, and he said, I went to sleep just, just very anxious. And he said, God woke me up out of that sleep before I went into surgery. And God told me, you are going to be okay. And I'm going to take care of you. He said, I went back to sleep in peace. He said, God didn't have to do that. But God wanted me to know that when I woke up, that that the reason I was okay was that he had taken care of me. Today, we can be very grateful to God that even if we're in a time of persecution or things aren't going our way, that we serve a God who will never leave us or forsake us. Thank you for studying uh, Revelation chapter two with me today. And I look forward to next week when we study the next church in this series.